Thank you all. And um, it's great to have such a fantastic lead in because it really builds on what I want to say. And just for the next five or seven minutes, I really want to sort of put the discussion that we're having around procurement into a broader global context and a national context and a state context and, um, and really sort of have that perspective of wh why is all this happening and, and why it's not going to go away. So I think it's particularly important when we are continually hearing negative things in the media. We feel like sometimes in the sustainability space we seem to be heading in the completely wrong direction, both at international and national level. So I wanted to sort of just lay the groundwork for us to think about this in a more holistic perspective. So what we do know globally is that 196 countries signed up to the UN um, Sustainable Development Goals, um, November 2015, um, for, and they are set in stone. It's the biggest signing of um, any commitment by the United Nations, um, and they're to 2030. So. If you haven't got your head around those, um, you need to. Um, and it's a very powerful global commitment. Um, Australia signed up. Surprisingly, we haven't heard anything about it, or maybe not surprisingly. And we were one of the very instrumental organisations at the back end, actually making sure that they really meet Australia's needs. And there's some great stuff there around responsible construction and consumption, around sustainable cities, which you know reflect this particular sector here. So that's very exciting and links into some of the broader conversations that everyone are having. It's social, it's broader, it's not just the environment. So I think that sits at the very top and that's that's very positive and then I think that can hold us in a space where we might be feeling a bit a bit uneasy. And then if we come down to Australia, we, we obviously know that we signed up to the COP21 Paris Agreement, um, made significant commitments around, commitment around keeping warming below two degrees and also made some um, targets around our CO2 emissions. So as far as we're aware, despite some things you might read in the paper yesterday, um, that's not going anywhere either. Um, so then we come down to the New South Wales government. Um, again, we're going through a lot of change in the New South Wales government, but in November 16, the New South Wales government announced a new climate policy. So if you haven't had a look at that, I suggest you have a look at that. Because what that said, and we had a launch of this for Office of in for our program area recently, and the facilitator said it was a very clever, boring policy document, um, and in it was hidden a radical, a radical agenda. Um, it doesn't look radical, but it is radical. If you think about the largest state in Australia making commitments around moving towards net zero and being resilient, and that's what that document says. So that's not going away either. Um, so that's not up for discussion, that's, that's set in stone. So we've got these three levels where we've got these foundations that are going to hold a lot of this, a lot of this work in, in place. The other interesting thing about the policy framework is that it puts adaptation and mitigation, so being resilient and reducing our emissions at the same level as equals. And I think that's really important and we're hearing about adaptation coming through, obviously, part in the supply chain. But I think that's been missing from a lot of our, our conversations and it holds them both up as equals and requires us to have more sophisticated thinking and more sophisticated conversations around being resilient, being adaptive and reducing emissions. Um, and then we've, we also heard about the standard, the ISO standard, so that's coming in, which again provides another foundation. So on a sort of a global and national and, and, and state front, we've got a lot of good things in place. And what we know about corporate sustainability approach to, to the supply chain, we've heard some great examples here today, is that they're taking this seriously as well. We've got a lot of international global leaders who are making the types of commitments we've heard today. Um, We've got, um, if you look at the We Mean Business website, that, that's a fantastic co um, summary of all the global organisations that are making commitments around carbon, around adaptation, around renewable energy. So, um, and that really comes off the back of the Paris negotiations. So, um, and as we've heard today, these organisations can't do it on their own. So Walmart has made a commitment to science-based targets so that global operations have to, carbon has to be reduced in line with one and a half to two degrees. Where does all their resources supply come from? China. So they're having this huge engagement with all their supply chain in China 
around how they can move their Chinese supply chain to a science-based target approach. Unilever, it's great to hear mervac has gone um, net zero by 2030. That's very ambitious, but we've got organisations like Unilever who are saying they're actually going net positive by 2030. So how, what that means and how they're going to do that, hugely challenging for a multinational operation. So again, they can't do it on their own. They have to partner with their supply chain. And I think what we're seeing at the moment, and some of you who are in this space would know, it's a stage process. We've talk, heard about relationship, partnerships. So we're starting with that, did you know about this sort of questionnaire information session or discussions? Are you doing anything, trying to test the waters? What are your suppliers doing? Um, then we want you to do certain things. And I think that's where the supply chain, that's that sophistication of that um, training. We want you to go here and do certain modules, or we'd like you to. And then, and then the next thing is, well, demonstrate that you have. Otherwise, there's going to be repercussions, and that's where that whole lovely carrot and stick comes in. And then at the further end, and some of this, and this is down the track, but we're going to be seeing verifying and providing data to us, the supplier, that this has been done, that you're not just nodding your head and saying, yes, we get this. So I think that's a, a long journey. Um, it will happen at different times and different stages for different organisations, but that's definitely the pathway that we're seeing. So we've also seeing, as we've heard today, that move away from the traditional focus on just on the environmental sustainability, um, human rights, um, Indigenous, um, social enterprise, how can we procure and actually add value, the lovely coffee shop um, example. Um, and it's not, it's hard to do, but when you see it in action, you see the, 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 the real value. And I think that again ties back into here. We've been very good at having conversations about the environment and conversation, different people have conversations about poverty or about inequality. But here it joins them all up together. And so I think the supply chain discussion is going to have to be broader, nuanced. It makes it challenging for us in that space to actually engage our suppliers around that. But that's definitely where, where it's heading. So where does, new, where does government procurement fit into all of this, you're probably asking. Well, we had a fantastic example that probably the leaders in New South Wales is transport who have been on this journey first up probably have the most greatest sophistication, um, which is great. Uh, where's the rest of government? Well, we're starting. And we can't have that policy and achieve that policy of net zero by 2050 without engaging our suppliers, our procurement. So we've now got a mandate. Um, and watch this space. Will all this happen as fast as, as we want it to? Probably not. but. Uh, it's definitely on our radar because as government, we realise that we like the, those organisations. That's where we can have our big, biggest impact. And again, it will initially be information. Um, it will probably be carrot rather than stick. But as time goes on, we will have to, again, ramp that up. So, so my advice is for those of you who are selling your goods and services to other organisations, which is pretty much all of us, is have a look at who you're selling to and if these things are interested into the organisation you're selling to, then they've got to be of interest to you. Um, and then finally, if you're selling into government, particularly the New South Wales government or the Victorian government or the ACT government that actually put some lines in the sand and said publicly that this is important, then it is going to start being um, on their radar as well. So those organisations who are on the front foot, who are being proactive, are going to be the ones who can meet those um, criteria, who will be those organisations that make it very easy for the transport of New South Wales to deal with because they get it and the, their applications and their tenders come in with it all on the right page. The same with, you know those organisations who get it because they've got the information. So advice is look who you're selling to. Um, if it's of interest to them, then it's of interest, should be of interest to you. And if you if it's not of interest to them, you'd have to ask, you know, what's their sus global sustainability in the long term? Because Whoever they're selling to, it, it is of interest to them. So um, exciting time, a positive time. Um, and you know, we're looking forward to seeing how we can continue to leverage off the, the supply chain school and some of the other organisations, the Responsible Construction Leadership Group, who are actually driving this um, change through the supply chain.
Thank you.